I make my own rules, one bonko party at a time. I write history and I read celebrities. I am JMZ. Life is a classroom and I'm here to teach. It's time for me to be going now. Pay me. Bah. To say truth, you did your part prettily, and your behavior was first rate. What left him in the lurch was the way you kept from laughing. Bah. Why bah? It's not needed any longer. Come, please, pay me well and nicely. Bah. Why bah? Talk sensibly and pay me. Then I will go on my way. Bah. Let me tell you something. You guess what I'm going to say. Please pay me without further railing. I've had enough of your bah. Pay me quick. Bah. Is this mockery? Is this the most you intended to do? Upon my oath, you shall pay me unless you can fly. Do you understand? Here, my fee. Bah! This is a jest. What? Is this all I am going to get? Bah! You are rhyming, but this is prose, hmm? Is there any green in my eye? Are you aware whom you were trying to take in? Babble to me no longer with your ba and pay me my fee. Ba. Is that the only cash I am to get? With whom do you fancy you are playing? And I was to take such pride in you. And let me be proud of you. Bah. Are you feeding me on goose? By gog arms, have I lived to see myself jeered at by an oaf, a sheep in clothing, a filthy churl? Bah. Is this the only word I am to hear? If you are merely fooling, say so, and spare me further argument. Come to my house for supper, Lemkin. Bah! By St. John, you are right. The goslings take the geese to pasture. I thought to myself the master of all deceivers, here and elsewhere, of the old stagers, too, and of such a, as pay their debts on doomsday. But a mere shepherd leaves me behind. By St. James! If I could find a bailiff, I'd have you nabbed. Bah! (sighs) Bah! Bah! Hang me if I don't go after a good bailiff. Bad luck to you, him, if he doesn't put you into the jail. If he finds me, I'll forgive him. That was a scene from the 15th century farcical play, The Farce of Master Pierre Patlon, but it also sounds like it could have been an exchange from a Real Housewives of New Jersey cast member and somebody trying to get the money that they owe them. Today, Jessica, Max, and myself will talk with Noah Gwynn about what the Real Housewives can teach us about this play and others like it. 
Noah Gwynn is a professor of French and comparative literature at UC Davis and is a specialist in medieval and early modern literature, theater, and culture. He has recently published a book with the University of Pennsylvania Press titled Pure Filth, Ethics, Politics, and Religion, an Early French Farce. He has also co-edited a special issue of Romantic Review called Category Crossings, Bruno Latour and the Middle Ages and an edited volume for Boydell and Brewer entitled Violence and the Writing of History in the Medieval Francophone World. Welcome, Noah Gwynn. Thank you so much for being here today. So welcome, Noah Gwynn. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Would you like to share your housewife's tagline with everyone? Absolutely, with pleasure. My tagline is, I didn't say middle-aged. I said middle-ages. <laughs> <laughs> that's good I like that, that was good thank you that was a good one and it, it's apropos because we're going to talk about your work the actual academic work you do can you tell us first about your own academic journey sure I'd be happy to um, well I'm a French medievalist um, and so I should tell you a little bit about how I got interested both in French and in the Middle Ages the French is kind of a genetic thing. My father was a French professor, um, and he took uh, my family to France for sabbatical years on two occasions when I was a kid. Once when I was seven years old, we were in Paris for uh, nine months, and then uh, a year in Aix-en-Provence when I was 13. So I was sort of thrust into language immersion um, and, um, and suffered greatly as a result. It was hard to be the, you know, the one kid at school who didn't speak the language and had to learn it. Um, but I returned to French in college and really discovered a love for it and have been obviously uh, on the path toward um, uh, uh, a degree in French ever since. Um, I became interested in the Middle Ages when I was in France, and it was kind of a strange childhood obsession. I loved climbing cathedral towers. I started at Notre Dame de Paris, where everyone goes to see the gargoyles and things like that. And um, I then wanted to climb as many cathedral towers as I could. I was seven, so it was seemed like a very exciting thing to do. But then, um, especially strange for a Jewish kid, I was obsessed with Gothic religious painting, especially Annunciation scenes and martyrdom scenes and all of that kind of thing. And according to my parents, as much gold leaf as possible was sort of my agenda. I <laughs> wanted to you were destined to Bravo. You were destined for Bravo and destined for your your, your field of study. So it's true. Me. It's true. It was, there was something very, very gaudy about it, but also that sort of. Um, I mean, I really was fascinated by the Virgin Mary and the Annunciation scene in particular because she always has this look on her face, like, "What are you telling me about my responsibility? What I'm going to have to do for God?" Um, so I was quite obsessed with that and, and, in fact, came back to it in college because I had a really wonderful teacher of medieval literature, medieval French literature, who sort of inspired me to, um, uh, to sort of read very deeply in the medieval literary tradition. Um, and so I did go to graduate school in French with the goal of being a medievalist. Um, it was the early 90s, and that was the sort of, um, you know, early days of the queer theory, queer studies movement. Um, and I was really interested in how medieval studies and queer studies could intersect. And um, that's really where my um, sort of intellectual agenda was born. Um, I was hired at uh, UC Davis, um, uh, not fresh out of graduate school, but not too long after. Um, and I um, uh, have been there ever since. Um, I've written about um, a, a bunch of different topics. Um, my first book was about allegory and um, sort of uh, literature in the 12th and 13th centuries. And then my second book, which is the one that just came out, is about farce and is in a much later period, sort of 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, so you've just published your new book, Pure Filth. Ethics, Politics, right. and Religion, an Early French Farce. Can you talk to us about your experience with the publishing process? And if you have any words of advice uh, for people publishing, how does it feel to have a second book out? 
it feels great. It really was a long time in coming. It was a difficult book to write because, uh, as I said, I was working in a much earlier period. Um, I was working in the high Middle Ages, really the 12th and 13th centuries, and the material that I became interested in was from the 15th and 16th centuries. And so it involved a huge retooling um, that took years and years uh, to achieve. Um, and I had to learn things about performance, performance as a practice, and the ways in which performance sort of exceeds and redefines the kinds of textual analysis that I was engaged in in my first book. Um, I also had to learn a great deal about archives and um, things about reconstructing performance using historical records and rethinking texts through the study of sources and how texts circulated. So that wasn't at all my training, and I had to really retool. So it was a, a very ambitious project. That, in fact, I did, had no idea how ambitious it was uh, when I set out to do it. So I'm, I'm, I'm at the other end of it now and feeling very relieved to have pulled it off. Um, my uh, press is Penn, um, and I'll, I'll tell you the, the one thing that is uh, really crucial about, um, well, the, the one major reason that I wanted to publish with Penn is that uh, the editor there is uh, not only someone who values research on medieval, in medieval studies, but who actually understands it from the inside. He was trained in medieval French studies, and he was a member of, and until recently, I think he was actually an officer in the Medieval Academy of America. So it was someone who um, really understood the project and you know, was willing to, to back it. Um, the presses know that medieval studies, and especially French medieval studies, that those are not big seller titles. And so there's a real need to capture an audience and to, to figure out how to, um, uh, to sell the book and get it in, in front of people's eyes. And, um, and Jerry Singerman was really terrific at that. So I'm, I'm thrilled with the press and really glad to have chosen it. That's well, wonderful. Excellent. I have a follow-up. I have a follow-up. Sure. I've only heard great things about you, Penn Press, by the way, mm -hmm. um, and how they work with you. What kind of classes did you say this could be in? Did you go broader than... History? Did you go across fields? Did you do? I mean, how did you market it? Part of the problem is that my corpus is not material that actually gets taught much at all. So, um, what kinds of classes this book would be assigned in? I really don't know. It would be graduate seminars in which medieval theater is either the topic or a topic. Um, but generally, I'm expecting that the readers who are going to be drawn to this book are probably not going to be using it for instruction. So that makes it even more difficult to sell, I suppose. Um, though, though, you know, hopefully there are, uh, you know, uh, graduate seminars here and there where people are, are, are teaching this kind of material and therefore can use the book. Um, the, the big thing for marketing was really the title. I had a huge struggle with my editor over the title. Um, because the original title that I proposed seemed to appeal to nobody. It was very dry and kind of boring, and um, they really wanted a title that was going to sell books. And so Pure Filth actually was the result of many, many different iterations of how about this, how about that, and um, eventually Pure Filth seemed to, to be the, the title that everyone thought would, would actually sell books, and hopefully it will. It seems to have um, tickled a lot of people's fancy. Could you explain the difference between the High and the Late Middle Ages? So the High Middle Ages are generally, or Central Middle Ages, are usually thought of as the 12th and 13th centuries. And the Late Middle Ages are usually thought of, at least in my field, as the 14th and 15th centuries. And the period that I actually work on is very, very late. So I work from roughly 1450 to 1550. And the sort of boundary marker of, you know, 1500 is usually thought of as that's when you're you're talking about the Renaissance. You're really talking about a post medieval period. Um, although the genre that I that I am interested in, a lot of the plays, most of the plays that we have that have survived, actually date from past the 1500 mark. So, in a lot of ways, it's not entirely a medieval studies project. This is a, a medieval and post medieval project. The farce as a genre is truly a medieval genre, and that's why I think of it as a, as a medieval studies project. Um, 
But I wanted to ask about this connection to queer studies and medieval studies and how you are um, working at that intersection. Right. I mean, it's an interesting um, uh, set of problems. When, when I hit graduate school, the idea of theory at all in medieval studies was kind of uh, a no-no. Um, it was very daring to say that theoretical models from the 20th century might have some kind of resonance with medieval materials. And um, I ran into some difficulty with um, you know, audiences from my work, uh, faculty who were advising me, uh, administrators in, in my uh, graduate department, um, over whether this was actually a feasible project and one that would get, um, uh, would earn an audience. Um, and queer studies just added an even more sort of complex layer um, because it was a very new field. And there was, first of all, a lot of homophobia in the academy um, and still is. You don't say. You don't say. Yes, it is. It, it, exactly. Well, and, and I faced my fair share of it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that I lost out on job opportunities. I'm, I know that I experienced a lot of homophobia from from faculty who, who were, you know, trying to steer me away from projects that they considered to be embarrassing or shameful. Or, so, yeah, it was a difficult moment. But what's happened in medieval studies, which is really wonderful, is that, first of all, theoretical medievalisms have taken off, um, especially in French and English medieval studies, but in, in all fields of, of you know, of, um, all subfields of medieval studies at this point. And queer studies has been huge. So there's been, um, there was right around the time when I was first hired at Davis, there was a, uh, a, a big uh, conference at NYU um, on the queer Middle Ages. And that was sort of the, the launching pad for a whole lot of really innovative and exciting new work. Um, so, yeah, that's the, the, the journey. And so... How did you come to settle on the topic of your most recent book project? So it's kind of a complicated story. Um, I was hired at Davis for a job that had been advertised for a theater specialist. And I was not at all a theater specialist when I applied for the job, but I was from California. I was raised in, in the Bay Area and I wanted to return. And so very opportunistically, I pitched the the, I made the claim that all of uh, medieval literature is performance-based. Um, and that's really actually quite true, right? That these are things that were either performed or read aloud in some way. And that there was obviously a kind of a theatrical component to even sort of straightforward narrative text. Um, and they bought it, which was wonderful because I got the job and I was thrilled to have it. Um, but then I needed to um, teach uh, a, every year a genre survey on uh, French theater. So I was responsible for figuring out how to teach uh, uh, French plays from the medieval period through the 20th century. And so I got to work. And the, the one play that I had really studied and, and knew fairly well was a farce. Um, it's a very famous farce. It's called Maître Pierre Passant. Um, and it's this uh, uh, really ingenious, very funny uh, play that I taught regularly. And I, I found it very um, exciting to teach. And eventually I sort of developed an article out of it. And from the article grew a, a book. Tell us a little bit about how, the, how, how it evolved from an article to a book. So the, the play that I regularly taught is, as I said, it's, it's called Maître Pierre Patelin. It's a, a 15th century play, um, and it's always been considered the masterpiece of the genre of medieval farce, and it's probably considered by most people to be the only masterpiece because there are some 200 uh, medieval farces that have survived into modernity, but no one has ever read any of them except for this one play. So it's called Patelin. 
And the, the, the germ of the article is that I was provoked as I was teaching the play by its final line. So the play is a courtroom drama, and it features an unprincipled shyster lawyer and his client, who is a shepherd, who has been accused of killing and eating his master's sheep. And what happens in the final scene of the play is that the, the lawyer instructs the shepherd not to say a word during his trial, but only to bleat like a sheep as if he were insane, mentally incapacitated in some way. But when the lawyer tries to collect his fee after the courtroom scene is over, the shepherd responds to his repeated demands for money with bleats. So he says, bah, bah, instead of actually offering the lawyer the money that he had demanded. So the lawyer is enraged, and he threatens to call the police to have the shepherd arrested. And it's actually probably even a worse thing, and very, a very topical one given our time, because police brutality was rampant in 15th century France. And in fact, the police were sort of known for, for not keeping the peace at all so much as busting skulls and, and things like that. So what the shepherd does is he initially just dodges the threat by, by bleeding like a lamb. Bah, bah, bah. But in the very, very last line of the play, he drops the act and he speaks a final line that I found deeply enigmatic and I didn't at all, at all know what to do with it. And the line in French is, S'il me trouve, je lui pardonne, which means in English, if he, and he means the policeman, so if the policeman finds me, I shall pardon him. And I was convinced as I was teaching this play that my students would ask me, why did the shepherd not simply keep bleating? Because that strategy had worked so well for him throughout the courtroom scene. Um, no student ever asked the question. They seemed to not be concerned by it at all. But I kept pondering it myself and really needed to figure out how to explain it, if not to them, at least to myself. And eventually what I concluded was that a play, this play that most scholars have read as deeply cynical um, and um, almost amoral, if not immoral, that it was in fact a play about forgiveness. Um, and that led me to the, the inspiration to write an article about farce and its ethical implications um, and to argue that a genre that's usually considered to be immoral or amoral is in fact deeply, deeply invested in ethics and a, a particular kind of Christian ethics. So it, if, you, if you follow, that scoundrel shepherd is a double for the shepherd of souls. And his last line is also about the last things of Christian eschatology, which are death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And since it's a courtroom drama, it's especially about Judgment Day. In fact, the, 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 the Judgment Day is referred from beginning to end of the play. It's referred to several times. Um, it's clearly clear that it's, it is, on the one hand, a day in court um, and a very corrupt kind of law but also the um, sublime, perfect law um, that will be enacted on Judgment Day. Um, so, yes, and, and where we will either be forgiven or not. Um, and and um, that question is one that the, great, the play, I think, is grappling with. And that sort of key concern for Christian ethics is, is the core claim for the book that, um, that I eventually wrote. So you've given us a little bit about French farce um, in terms of what it is as a genre, but can you expand on it and maybe help define it for us? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think everyone sort of has a sense of what farce is, but uh, uh, you really need to understand a bit about its history to, um, to understand it more fully. Um, it's sometimes said to be the only genre of medieval drama to have survived into modernity. And there's some real truth to that claim because all the other genres, miracle plays, mystery plays, morality plays, really have not survived uh, uh, past that, that uh, sort of um, the early 16th century. Um, but farce was ubiquitous in 16th and 17th century France. Sometimes, in fact, farces were called, um, you know, petite comédie because um, farce was considered to be lowbrow, low class. Um, and instead they were called something different, but they were clearly very much 
farces. Um, and farce exerted a really profound influence on humanist comedy and eventually on playwrights like Molière, um, whose early career was as an itinerant farceur who wandered around France and performed on makeshift stages that were erected in public places, often out of doors, um, for audiences from all social classes and all walks of life. So really, when people ask me what I work on, um, the the thing that I reach for uh, uh, first usually is to say, well, I, I work on the precursors of Molière, because Molière is an author that most people know. So what first generally is, is short, there are maybe 300 to 500 lines, whereas a classical comedy from, you know, um, a, a figure like Molière is, is usually 1,500 to 2,000 lines. So they're considerably shorter. Their characters are often very flat characters. They don't have a lot of psychological complexity to them. And um, they're used to embody stereotypes, often very crude ones. Um, and... You can see that in work, at work in the fact that they are often not named at all um, or are named for the social category that they belong to. So a character may be called la femme, the woman or the wife, um, uh, the priest, the cobbler, the miller, and so on and so forth. Um, and perhaps the, the signature of the genre is that they are vulgar. Um, extremely vulgar, um, usually both sort of sexual and scatological jokes, uh, lots of them, um, often quite shocking to uh, modern sensibilities. I find it endlessly delightful, but <laughs> not everyone does. I am, do I. <laughs> Good, I'm glad, I'm glad, glad to have a fellow traveler. Um, mm -hmm. And they, they often have very flimsy scenarios. There's not so much you can do in 300 to 500 lines, and so the scenarios have to be fairly concise. Um, and they're usually about some kind of social inversion. So a wife who beats her husband, a servant who bosses around his or her master, a tenant who cheats his landlord, and, and things like that. And then the last thing I'll say is that farces are all about vulgarity, buffoonery, mischief. Um, and that's why scholars have generally thought that these are plays that have uh, a general lack of concern for elevated content, edifying content, the kinds of thing that you find in medieval genres like the morality play, the miracle play, the mystery play, which are genres that are obviously about, um, more obviously about ethics and religion. Um, though one thing worth noting is that mystery plays often had interludes, and those interludes were typically farces. Um, and so even in a very edifying uh, genre, there was a sense that the audience wanted the vulgarity and buffoonery and mischief of a farce. So, um, and that, that popularity is, is something that, um, that can't really be denied. There are over 200 surviving farce scripts from the period between 1450 and 1550, and that's a lot. There, there's, a, there's a lot of them. Um, and there's also a great deal of evidence to suggest that audiences were drawn from all social ranks and all milieu, so they were poor but also wealthy. Um, farces were performed at court, but they were also performed in marketplaces. Um, they were performed on the uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the square outside of a church, um, on makeshift stages at carnival, things like that. So could we say oh. that farce was kind of the Bravo TV of the middle ages? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I, I was actually going to go a little, a little step down from Bravo TV uh -huh. to some of these other, um, other reality shows, um, okay. And I was going to say something that would get me in trouble if I ever wanted to work in this business. So let's go with Casey's. Let's go with Casey's question. Bravo, farce in a way. Yes. Yeah. I, I do think they anticipate Bravo um, quite a bit. They are definitely it's mass culture, and um, it is what the Middle Ages had um, because they didn't have TV. Um, and there are other forms of mass culture, but theater was really one of them. And there's lots of evidence to suggest that th 
theater was the way that people got news. It was the way that people got access to um, a sort of a collective experience um, that um, that we generally have through TV. So what medieval French farce play? What, where would you suggest someone jump in? Um, you can't just jump in with anything, can you? Yeah. Where, where, would, one, where would a comedy, uh, a self-proclaimed comedian like myself, uh-huh. where would I jump in? The official answer would probably be that the masterpiece of the genre is that play Patelin, and there are translations of it that you can find easily online and elsewhere. But I have to admit that those translations are mostly disappointing because they're very scholarly, um, but they don't get a lot of the recklessness and the vulgarity of the genre, which is, to me, the most exciting part. So the answer to that, the best answer to that question, I think, is um, two volumes of farces that were published um, in the same series as my book at Penn Press by a colleague at UC Santa Barbara whose name is Jody Enders. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jody is an eminent scholar, and so her her translations are filled with editorial commentary that are about history and language, and she provides all kinds of wonderful, very scholarly insights into the plays. But she's also um, really relishing the uh, and trying to capture the filth uh, that obviously I find uh, really exciting, um, and is willing to um, adapt more than translate so um, and to adapt with in a very freeform way where there are all kinds of very deliberate anachronisms and since first was filled with um, sort of quotations of popular song she feels free to quote all kinds of popular culture that has nothing to do with the middle ages but then a modern reader will recognize immediately and uh, sort of get uh, uh, I think a closer understanding of the genre that way and the play that I like most, it's in her first volume of translations, and it's called Monkey Business. Um, monkey spelled monk hyphen E-Y. <laughs> um, and I, I write about this play in, in the last chapter of my book. It's about a lecherous monk, the woman he tries to rape, and the ways that she punishes him. And the ways that she punishes him are just endlessly fascinating. She convinces her husband to wear her clothes, so the the actors switch clothes, and we have to bear in mind that both actors would probably have been male. Mm-hmm. Um, but the husband takes his takes his wife's dress, puts it on, and then shows up at the monastery for confession. And what a, a French audience would have known full well, um, and that um, you know a, a good translator helps you to understand is that confesser, which means to confess in French. Um, is also a well-done pun. Con is the C word in French, and fessé um, uh, is the F word in French. Let's put it that way. I'll <laughs> clean up my own language. So um, w- what that confession means, right, is a- an act of rape. Um, but what it becomes in the sort of scene as it's set by this ingenious wife is an opportunity to beat the living daylights out of the monk because the husband has concealed an enormous rod under his dress, which gives you all of the sort of gender play that I find so fascinating is that he is both male and female simultaneously. Um, and that ingenious costume and disguise that what, what we might call farce because farce means sort of, um, um, in some sense, just illusion um, is what allows um, uh, an easily victimized woman or an easily victimized class, because the woman and her husband are working class, is an opportunity to get a revenge on uh, an elite, a, a representative of the elite. So that's a really good transition to talking about um, between your work on housewives for lack of a better word and households in medieval plays um, to talking about the ways that you see housewives and households um, looking similar and or different when comparing them to the real housewives. Um, Can you talk a little bit about those comparisons? Yeah, happy to. I I am as obsessed with the housewives as I am with 
medieval sparse, so I can <laughs> tell you all kinds of things. Although I, I'll start by saying this, I'm generally suspicious of drawing analogies between medieval and modern cultural forms because analogy can be a slippery, um, a slippery maneuver mm-hmm. to make, um, intellectually speaking. Um, but in this instance, it's really hard not to make that analogy, and I'll tell you why. Uh, both medieval farce and the Real Housewives are driven by interminable, repetitive forms of conflict, which I find really fascinating. So, to me, the 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 fights are the reason to watch Bravo, um, and that means that they can only be resolved temporarily and they have to actually resurface and recur and there has to be a shuffling of personnel so that, you know, one alliance turns into, an, you know, a, a, um, you know, a, a enemies and, and vice versa. Um, and the, the aggression gets redirected, but it always has to be about aggression. Um, the other thing that the genres share is that they're both really overtly sexist. So to me, it's important to remember that the housewives are diminished by the title of the show that they appear on. It's a lie. Obviously, there's no one on these shows who actually fits the, the definition of a housewife. Um, but it is the signal that the show is giving of um, what uh, idealized femininity looks like. Um, and so it is something that the shows have to grapple with is, is a regressive vision of femininity that needs to either be reappropriated or redefined in some way. And Farce Wives is kind of similar. Um, they're so misogynistic in their conception that, as I said, they, they often don't have a proper name. They're sometimes just simply called La Femme. And all of them, or nearly all of them, are modeled on some kind of degrading sexist form of essentialism. So the woman is a shrew or a scold. The wife is a cheat or a slut. She's a ditz or a dupe. She's a temptress or she's a femme fatale. All of those sort of uh, sexist tropes get deployed and often the character is sort of summed up by that kind of trope. But, and this is for me what's really, really exciting and vitally important about both Farce and Bravo, is that neither genre would exist at all if it weren't for truly unruly female characters who challenge conventions of self-effacement and self-denial and who translate those tropes into innovative forms of female protagonism. So in the case of housewives, that means celebrity and media influence and sexist cliches become opportunities to seize media attention and defend access to it. And I find it really endlessly fascinating that this is done by middle-aged women who have aged out of the entertainment industry. A lot of them are, are actors who no longer have a place. Uh, Don't in the tell Ramona industry. she's aged out. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good point. They've aged out of being able to be on real, you know, on 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 scripted shows. Right. Yeah. So can you give me a uh, Bravo Demic moment? So can we link this? Give us an example of who you see this a farce uh, uh, replayed in. So who would be a, a a good example on some of these shows? I know you've thought about it. Yeah. I know you've thought about it at length. So. Give us an example. Oh, gosh. Well, I think it's true that so many of these uh, women are comedians at heart. Um, the, the Real Housewives of Atlanta in particular, I think, have just a genius for repartee and witticisms. And sometimes, the, on, especially in other franchises, the humor isn't so intentional. Um, so you're kind of laughing at them rather than with them. Um, I don't know if I have a specific example to give you of a, an episode of The Real Housewives that seems like farce to me, but it's almost because there are too many examples to do okay. stuff, to, 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 to find one. I mean, it really is. The analogies are very, very clear. Well, I'm thinking about what would, what do we do with Sonia Morgan? If she was, a character 
because she is a character. Mm. <laughs> if she was in a farce, like what role would she occupy as a, as a housewife? Because you said there was a temptress, there was a slut, there was a comedian. That you know, there's different roles that the housewives occupy. Yeah. What what, what do we do with Sonia? I mean, um, Sonia is fascinating because she's a Morgan. Because her her status, which she clings to, comes from the very wealthy man she married and then divorced. Um, so, in a way, she is exactly that figure of the housewife who owes the status that she has in the world to a man. But she's also unstoppable, um, uh, just unwilling to be put in a corner. I'm thinking of that episode recently when um, I can't remember the the it's a sort of a a, a, a kind of supporting role character who says um, your husband used you as an accessory. That's exactly the scene I was thinking of. Yeah, That's exactly, right. what, and and her comeback was. I, I mean, I don't remember entirely what it was, but it was so utterly vulgar and embarrassing that it really was, don't try and put me into that role, even though it's quite obvious that that's the role that I did occupy. And when I'm, when I'm cornered in this way, what I'm going to come at you with is utter vulgarity and buffoonery. I become a clown and I show you exactly why you watch these shows, which is because I'm endlessly entertaining. Her husband is endlessly unentertained. No one cares about him or wants to wants to, to know anything about that marriage. What they want to know is how it is that this um, um, endearing and uh, absurd woman lives out her life um, not at all as a housewife, but instead in the aftermath of being a housewife. Thank you. So the scene I'm referring to, because it's like been the most shocking all season long, and I'm probably going to get it reversed. I'm probably going to get what she said reversed. But when basically someone told her that they that she was a prop, she said, she basically said, but I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong by my Bravo episode by episode uh, uh, experts here, she said something to the woman about the woman being a whore, something about, you know, the, I'm not a whore, I'm not a slut. And she said, and I don't even, I don't even shave my pussy. Or, <laughs> or was she saying I shave my pussy? I can't remember, but there was shaving. I think she waxing. was saying that she wasn't, that she doesn't shave, right? And she said yeah. a few times. Yeah. Like my implication that if you have a Brazilian wax or a little landing strip that you're the whore. But right. I, I think I sent Max and Casey a note. Um, and said, how many more times are we going to have to hear about her intimate parts? Do we either <laughs> see them or we hear them? <laughs> see them or we hear about them. So, that I mean, I didn't need to know that. Well, and it doesn't stop with her, which does make her very much a, um, a farce character. It doesn't stop with that part of her private region, right? right? I mean, it, she's a, a scatologist like no one's business, and I admire that about her as well. Constantly yeah. farting. Yes. I mean, yeah. just vulgar. I mean, she's vulgar. She right. she is the essential. That's why I was wondering. It's funny that that's the thing you remember, too. Yeah. Um, it's something I find really brilliant about the New York Housewives in particular is the way in which they merge um, high class and low class, that they're really interested in the, the kind of branding that means that they have luxury objects all over the place and they go to the right restaurants and they go to the right hotels and, um, and yet they behave in these ways that are incredibly vulgar. So we get this kind of mishmash of um, mass culture, lowbrow taste and, um, and true wealth really expensive taste at the same time. Um, I always like to know how people got into reality TV. And we ask this question of a lot of people. And usually I'm the one that's watched every single show <laughs> people mention. But how, how did you get into watching reality TV? Did you have a Gateway Real Housewives franchise or Bravo show? How did you get us to this moment where we're talking about Sonia Morgan's inappropriate comments? So what I said of Sonia is actually very true of me as well. I um, have very highbrow tastes, but my lowbrow tastes go about as low as they go. So, 
<laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled to go to the opera and the theater and the symphony, but I also uh, love, I, I mean, my reality TV taste has gone far below Bravo. I mean, I, I shudder to think of, of the other shows that I, and will not admit to oh, watching. Please. These <laughs> oh, please. Everyone is open here. There's no shame. There's no shame in your, in your Bravo game, as one of our guests said. Well, I, I mean, I guess I can admit to this. We, I used to watch that show, um, what was it called? Uh, Bad Girls Club. No, I haven't watched that I don't one. know what that is. What's oh, that one about? It was, it, it's about, um, it has basically no premise <laughs> it, other than women with um, younger women in their sort of early 20s um, often with mental health uh, issues and criminal records, um, sort of thrust into a communal living situation in a very sort of gaudy, fancy house, usually in LA or maybe Miami, I don't know, it's somewhere along those lines. Um, and it's all about who's going to get kicked off because they couldn't resist throwing a punch or... Yeah, it, it really is <laughs> utterly, utterly awful, <laughs> and um, and yet I watch. I mean, it, I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. I'm not sure why. I, I one of my favorite games to play with a bunch of medievalists who, generally speaking, think of themselves as you know highbrow, you know culture people, because um, we study the very, very deep past. Um, I, I ask what um, what my colleagues' guilty TV pleasures are. And that's the one I trot out as, well, this is the, the worst it's ever gotten. But there are other people who seem to be out to, to beat me, or at least to keep up, because um, I find that lots of people have lots and lots of um, really grungy taste in, in <laughs> TV. Bad Girls um, Club sounds like it's like the cousin of Paradise Hotel 2. Meets Big Brother. Not Paradise Hotel One, Paradise Hotel Two. Well, Two was so good, and like they didn't even know why they were at this resort on this gorgeous island. They just knew that there might be money at stake, and uh, right. you know, and it was always like couple See, up or ship out. But like they had no clue what they were even competing for, you know. Uh, and it, but it was so like deliciously trashy. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. The, the way, in answer to your question, the way that I got to Bravo is by watching over my husband's shoulder. Um, he, uh, you know, watched it pretty obsessively, and, and I just thought, what is this crap? Even though, obviously, as I said, I have terrible <laughs> taste. Um, but eventually, I just got sucked in. I was really grabbed by um, by what I was seeing. Um, and uh, I think the, the entree for me was was probably uh, Beverly Hills and that trip to Amsterdam when Brandy slaps Lisa Vanderpump and then Lisa Rinna throws the wine and breaks the glass. And Kyle Richards. I mean, it really is. It, it was just such an, an unforgettable moment. Although the, the other one, I, I was um, trying to think of really unforgettable moments on the housewives. And I think the one that, that, grabs me the most is actually the opposite. Something incredibly touching um, is that moment when Nini broke down on the Atlanta reunion and revealed that her mother hadn't raised her to see her in a moment of um, really a breakdown of total vulnerability was, was unforgettable. Um, and yeah, I think those, those, um, episodes probably were the thing that sucked me in. And, and now I, um, you know, we're in a, a Bravo desert right now. They seem to be, seem to be rationing the episodes and I'm, I'm not sure what to do with myself. I would like them to stop rationing and just open the vault. Cause you know, they have so much material that we have never seen. And I don't even care if they edit it. Just give us raw, uncut, like what you what you get, you know? I would devour it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really like watching it with the cast members or, you know, random people and commenting, like the old couch set, set up, whatever show they had where you sat on the couch. Yeah. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like that. I would like raw footage or, yeah, raw footage. I don't like them just talking to be talking about things we've already seen. 
So I've been watching um, shows that I did not know on Bravo, um, in- including I started with Vanderpump, which I really just disliked. Um, again, <laughs> watching, watching over my husband's shoulder with total disdain. But I decided to watch it from beginning to end. And in fact, I, I did. It took a while. Um, and I was pretty sucked in by that. I've done the same with um, Southern Charm, Southern Charm New Orleans, and um, uh, oh, I'm right now binging uh, The Shaws. And so, you know, the, I think all of those shows are actually kind of great. There's, they're really fascinating things about all of them. Yeah, the they're a good about- watch. They're a good watch, and the good thing about them rerunning and pulling other, you know, shows that I've never seen, um, I am, am sending, again, Casey and Max texts all the time saying, wait, when did they have this version? When did they have, I don't remember what the last one was, million dollar listing somewhere, <laughs> or, you know, just some random thing that didn't make it past one season. And I'm hooked just because it's new and different, and it's on Bravo. Yeah. New because it's old, right? <laughs> but new to me. Right. So that new because it's old is actually a great segue into our Banco Party game break today. So today's game is called Center Stage, and I'm going to be pulling up the lyrics for this game. So in Center Stage, I am going to read some lyrics uh, from a Bravo hit, and you, the panelists, will work together to figure out what words complete um, the chorus or verse of the song that I start reading to you. So I pulled four different songs. Um, You'll also have to tell me what song this is. I guess that's kind of implicit in having to know how to finish the song with the lyrics. So um, to start, uh, let's try this. Are you guys ready? Any questions? You don't have to sing it. (laughs) Okay. You can if you want. Um, So the first one. Elegance (laughs) is learned, my friends. Elegance learned. How many men are there that forget to hold the door when I give them so much more than they can imagine? Money rich and manners poor never got the boys too far. Money talks, but I just walk when I can't stand it. And the primary mistake, texting on a date, if you make a lady wait, she'll take a pass. The lesson all should learn, even if there's cash to burn, respect yourself because no one else can change your path. Am I supposed to say money can't buy you class or am I supposed to give you a whole? I don't even have any idea where that would be located in the Bravo repertoire, much less the, the, the line. Anybody else have a song? Oh, it's definitely money. Yeah, to- it totally class. is. I just, you know, wanted to give oh, a little suspense. Uh, so actually, yes, money can't buy you class is the next line. Do you guys know the rest of the verse? Or I guess that would be the chorus. I would like to hear you sing the rest of the verse for sure. <laughs> you don't actually need to be able to sing to sing it. Very, yeah. very appropriate point, yes. Right, it's kind of like sing talking, right? So, uh, money can't buy you class. Money can't buy you class. This is my countess impression. Elegance is learned, my friends. Elegance is learned. Uh, oh yeah. Uh. <laughs> Let's put on some synchronized music and a little voice distortion. There, you're a singer. Uh, the next one. Hurry up, baby! Don't be late. I'll meet you at the place. I've been waiting for this day, this weekend. Let's celebrate. Looking like a cover girl, covered in diamonds and pearls. Take the bends out for a swirl. Drop that top. Yeah, it's my world. Forget about work and the stress of the week. Party all night and we won't go to sleep. We own the club. Oh, yeah, we own the life. And I'm not leaving till I see daylight. I don't know the I don't know the name of the song, but I know it was that a Melissa Gorga song. No, Noah, any ideas? No, Max. Max, yeah, to take yourself on mute. Don't be tardy for the party. That was, that, was that, was that was my second. That was my second. Now, if you do that four times in a row, that's the whole chorus. You want to finish it off for us? 
Don't be tardy for the party. Ooh, ooh. Don't be tardy for the party. <laughs> okay, what's the next one? Okay, well, I guess this will be the last one. I thought, I thought maybe we would be more of a karaoke group. I probably thought wrong. <laughs> Oh, I can't sing. <laughs> yeah, no, people are I just now going to isolate you and me singing <laughs> these songs. Uh, it's going to get used later against us. Well, and I and I thought that, you know, since we were talking about theater and farce, like, you know, big boisterous game. Um, anyway, this last song. I'm reckless, offensive, I destroy your defenses. My guest list is priceless. And yes, I run a tight ship. Bentleys and Benzies through cash card and lensies and dollars and senses. Cha-ching. Giovanni? No. Is this most Erica Jane? It is an oh, Erica yeah. Jane. Well, yeah, that actually gets played out in the real world, so... I would say that was the biggest. I don't know the name of it. Um, nah. It's expensive to be me. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, like in my head, I'm like, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. it's expensive to be me. I, I'm sure that you guys can't see this because Max strategically positioned himself off camera to do his Erica Jane dance. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of those moments I hate to say it but I think this is one of those moments that I wish we had a TV show because this is priceless you just want to match his hands out of the side <laughs> my kitty's like a python to ticking like a time bomb limited edition gotta buy it with no try on yeah this is Max sings this song a lot around the house doing chores <laughs> 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 well, that concludes our Bunko game break for today. Be sure to join us next time for our exciting conclusion in part two of our interview with Noah Gwynn. As always, you can find us at historiansonhousewives.com where you can propose your own episode topic, ask us questions, and send us feedback. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at historiansh. And don't forget that you can like and review the podcast on your podcast platform. Thank you, Noah Gwynn. This show was brought to you with the support by Barbara and Mark Spear, Saddleback Community College, Molly Callahan, Dr. Joaquin Galarza, Courtney Crow, Lara Loper, Luis Asio de Dios, and the Agipong Foundation. And remember, scholars do bravo too. Uh, money can't buy you class. Money can't buy you class. This is my countess impression. Elegance is learned, my friends. Elegance is learned. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs>